Delighted to be here with you this morning. Welcome to Bethel Bible Fellowship. If you're new with us, we are continuing our study in the book of Ephesians. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have some extended time as I prepare for these messages. And uh, as you may know, the teaching team gets together weekly and we talk about our preparations and uh, talk through some different things. And so um, when it was my turn to speak about what we were going to be looking at this morning, um, and I listened to some of the other guys, I said, well, yeah, if I have about 12 pages, I know roughly, you know, how long that's going to be. It'll fit in our time frame. And I said, well, I've got about 32 pages. So I decided I really needed to start trimming that down. And so I began to trim that down and I trimmed it from 32 to 40. <laughs> and I, I'm sorry, good work. Thank you. <laughs> and, and I began to realize I, this is not working. Um, and so we're going to be, uh, it reminds me of a pastor who reported, had his annual report and to the mission. I literally heard him say this, and he said, well, we built our church from 25 to 12 this year, um, which, you know, is a kind of about the way I feel, uh, only in the opposite respect of what we're going to be looking at. But this is such a powerful portion, and I just continue to let it uh, marinate within my soul, and I hope that I'll be able to share with you the things that I believe that, that God wants us to grasp and understand this morning. With that, I'm going to just pray one more time. Father, you know that I'm at the end of myself, that nothing from my mouth is of any value except what you have said. And so, Father, we ask that you would bring only what you desire this morning, that you would teach our hearts. Well, we're learning so much about what it is that you want for us, both positively and negatively. So, Lord, help us, we pray, to grasp these principles for your honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at verses in chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. Uh, it's made up of just two sentences. Two sentences. The first sentence, yeah, you think, what in the world are you doing with getting 40 pages out of two sentences? Well, the two sentences here, the first are verses 17 through 19, and they deal with our old self, our old walk. And in the section beyond that, verses 20 through 24, we see the new walk, what God has called us to. Did you know that the uh, Food and Drug Administration says that there is a permissible amount of rat feces allowable in cereal grains because they're just impossible to eliminate the infestations that happen? Likewise, do you know why chocolate is so hyperallogenic for many people? Because it is literally impossible to remove all of the roaches that infest the cacao beans. Now, that really hasn't stopped me from eating chocolate a whole lot, but, uh, um, but those are facts, and I just thought I'd share that with you because they are applicable to what we're considering this morning. What is it that characterizes the Gentile way of life or the unregenerate way of life. And that's what we're going to be looking at. So let's, I'm going to read through the entire passage and then we'll begin to pick it apart um, just very uh, lightly, I'm sure, but we'll do our best to grasp some of these major chunks. And this comes on the heel of Paul's exhortation in verse 1 of the same chapter to walk worthy of the calling that we have received in Christ Jesus. And he picks up from that exhortation there and gives us another command here. And he says, so I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, 
and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. What is it that characterizes the Gentile walk, the, that of the unregenerate? Well, the first thing we see here is Paul starts off by, by giving us a most intense exhortation. The wording here is, is very strong, and it's been translated in a couple of different ways. This, this, uh, my particular NIV uh, uses the word, and I, I tell you this, and I insist on it. Uh, others use a different, different terminology, but uh, one, of the, uh, one of the strongest that I read was a, a great translation saying, I solemnly declare to you that you must no longer live as the unregenerate Gentiles do. It's a powerful challenge to us. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a parenthetical few moments, if I may, because there's some things we need to understand. We're talking about here what we used to be. God is setting forth the challenge that that's a, it was a horror. It was destructive. Uh, and, and we can look back at our own lives and see what that may have been like. We, we go back to Ephesians 2 and we see an apt description of our lives before Christ, uh, that we, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Uh, and so he talks about being dead. He talks about being in the old self, the old nature, sometimes referred to as the flesh. And it's, it, that terminology varies a little bit throughout the New Testament. But he also talks about the new self. And so I, I just wanna, wanna consider what it is that we need to understand about the new self and the old self. The New Testament is clear in that in Christ, the believer becomes something or someone completely new. A very excellent verse that we are all familiar with probably is 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Now, that's not something that we did. That's something that God does. And he says, the old has gone, gone. And the new has come. Well, sometimes I think we've had a tendency to, to believe or feel that there's this, this huge uh, wrestling match going on. You ever hear the, the white dog and the, the, the black dog? And you know that if you feed the white dog more, he's going to do better. And, and if you have the black dog, and those are representative of the new, uh, you know, the new uh, uh, self and the old self. But, but in reality, we have a problem with that illustration, that word picture. Because the new nature is not something that's just added to the old nature. The new nature replaces the old nature. It's not just a, a new coat of paint over an old structure. Galatians 2.20, Paul reminds us and says that I have been crucified with Christ. Now, it just, you know, in this day and age, it may not mean all that much to us. We wear crucifixes around our neck. Do you see anybody with an electric chair around their neck? little symbol of an electric chair, firing squad, uh, lethal injection. No. It was the symbol of death. And we need to be reminded of the fact, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. In the life that I live in the body, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. It's not just a, a new coat of paint, not just a covering. You know, the New Testament tells us that we are all in Christ. We are, have so many new aspects to our minds, our will, our heart, our inheritance, our relationships. a new power, new knowledge. We're going to see that, so much of this in this passage. Wisdom, a new world view. Boy, that is a powerful one. A new understanding that God gives to us. 
righteousness, love, desires, even a new citizenship because we are members of heaven's citizenship. Romans 6, 4 is a good summary. We've been buried with him through into death, into his death through baptism. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You get the picture? Totally new. Totally transformed. There's a new I. The former had a love of evil. John 3, 19, men loved darkness because their deeds were evil. That was me. That was you before Christ. So our new life in Christ isn't just an addition of the new self to the old, but rather an eradication of the old self and a creation of the new self. And God does all of that. It's incredible. We need to grasp that. I know that, that um, we, we're going to weave in back and forth a couple of things here. Uh, what is the nature of this, this new life? And we'll look at that in the passage, but I want to give you some overall principles again before we dive in there. You know, there's a, a very unique connection between the mind, and I'm not just talking about the brain, the mind, the body, and the heart. Ezekiel 36, God makes a promise and says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And he's not in this context talking about his Holy Spirit because that comes later, a reference, a new spirit within us. I will remove from your heart, the, from you, the heart of stone. Well, we're going to see that in this passage, the callousness the hardness of our hearts without Christ. And I'm going to give you a heart of flesh, a new heart. Not the pump, but the very essence of who we are. And then he wraps up a couple of verses later, and I will save you from all your uncleanness, the purity, the purification that he brings to us. So now the new believer has a love of God and a love of his law and a hatred for sin. The new nature is given to us and it's righteous and it's holy and there is no sin in the new nature. So let's talk about the connection briefly here between the mind, the body, and the heart. We'll talk about kind of our responsibility here, but I just want to remind you of, of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul's summation he says in in view of god's mercy of all that he's done i want you to offer your bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to the lord and then he goes on he says don't conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, but not the brain, the whole essence of who we are. The mind and the body are so totally connected in the essence of who you are and that complete transformation. Do you not know that the body, that your body, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, is the temple of God, of the Holy Spirit, who's in you? Therefore, in verse 20, honor God with your body. And then finally, interesting, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 and 5. This is classic. We see the connection of mind and heart. Paul says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Not just their logic, but their whole essence. So they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. They can't see it. They are blinded. Well, how in the world did God combat the blinded mind? 
Well, we see that two verses later. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light to shine in our hearts. We were blinded in our minds, and God brought his light into our hearts. They are connected in every way, shape, and form. Let me stop there with our kind of parenthetical thought. We'll come back to some things. Let's just uh, begin by, by looking at, at some of these. I'm sorry, I, do have, I have three sets of notes. One's a 40-page, one's a 9-page, and one's a 4-page. Which one would you like? Um, so, so forgive me if I have, I, I did have that clipped. Did it fall? No, it didn't. There it is. It's underneath these others. Thank you. I tell you this and insist on the Lord, and that's another consideration here. This isn't Paul's opinion. He goes and he's talking to these believers in Asia Minor, and, he, and, and the question that comes to my mind in the presentation of this passage is, why does he have to address this? Don't live like you used to live anymore. I solemnly declare in the Lord. This is God's command, not just Paul's. And he begins to describe what the old walk was like. First of all, he says, they were futile in their thinking. Futile in their thinking unproductive. There was nothing of profit. It was vain and empty. And he goes on to add to that, verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. He sets forth a very ugly picture here. He's already told us what great benefits we have in Christ. We've been, in this chapter, called to salvation. We've been unified in the body of Christ. Matt brought that out to us beautifully last week. We've been gifted by God's Spirit. So much of our, the message last week was about spiritual gifts, and every believer has been given that as an opportunity to serve the body of Christ and bring glory to God. And we've been strengthened by gifted men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, pastors. Those are gifted men to the church. But guess what? That's not going to happen. Well, as a result of all those good things, the church will grow. You know, we got some new babies around here, right? Where's that baby? Oh, man, get him out of here. What do you have to do to make that little critter grow? Feed it. That's it. God takes care of the rest. The body needs to be fed as each member does its own work. But that won't happen. That won't happen if we continue to walk like we used to. We will not build up the body of Christ and come to maturity and unity. No, we will be weak, feeble. I can't even begin to describe all of the negative results from our mixing the new with how we used to be. Well, how do these Gentiles live anyway? Well, you know, we could consider... Ephesus, particularly, just as an example, Ephesus was known as one of the most corrupt, immoral cities in Asia Minor. The, uh, the worship of, guy, of idols was, was everywhere, uh, particularly one that was worldwide known. It was that of uh, the temple. They had the Temple of Artemis, which was so grand, it was referred to as one of the seven wonders of the world. <laughs> wow. Not sure we could talk about our building here in that rubble, but that's what it was. The temple also referred to as the Temple of Diana, center of immorality, 
It was called the most lascivious city in all of Asia Minor. And the temple worship of Artemis or Diana had such wicked practices that were so common, unimaginably. The idol itself was a representation of some kind of a, a cross between a cow and a wolf. The idol goddess was served by thousands of temple prostitutes, eunuchs, singers, dancers, priests, and priestesses. Many of the idol representations were made out of different materials, but one of the most common and most coveted was that of silver. And we read in Acts chapter 19 about Demetrius, a silversmith. Oh, this guy's great. I love it. He has a problem with the Apostle Paul. What's his problem? <laughs> he called together all the craftsmen the, and in their related trades to this idol. And he says, men, you know we receive a good income from this business. Well, first of all, we've got to recognize his motive. Money. Religion for profit. That is prevalent today as well. And he goes on to say, he says, you see and hear how this fellow Paul is convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and practically the whole province of Asia. Boy, this is really going to cut into our business. You know what he says? He says, man-made gods are no gods at all. To me, this is the most flagrant evidence of corrupt thinking imaginable. He actually declares Wow, Paul says man-made gods are no gods at all. Is that logical? Is that the kind of God you want to worship? Yeah, I made this, and that's my God. Ah, oh, it's nonsense, even as so much of our thinking today. There were so many other practices, but there's no value in us talking about the things that were done in Ephesus, especially in regard to worship. But you can picture this little body of believers here in Las Cruces. And what, if we were to have some kind of an equivalent, you know, we have an heiress bookstore, and we have right next to it their newly created dance hall over by the truck stops. And imagine there was one of those on almost every block. And then there's little Bethel Bible Fellowship in the midst of all of that corruption. God did extraordinary miracles in Ephesus to bring people to himself. Boy, there's some great stuff, and, what, and we can't take time to go into all that God did there, but the amazing thing was that many who saw the miracles and heard Paul's presentation of the truth, they came openly confessing their sin, and what did they do? It says a number of them brought their magic arts, their, their paraphernalia, all of this stuff, and made a heap and burned it. What a picture. What a picture of repentance and turning away from these worthless, evil things. And it says that the value, it's even recorded here, approximate value of the items that were burnt in our day and age, would be around seven and a half million bucks. And I'm thinking, that's not a small amount. That was an incredible change of heart. So we're called to be different. They're futile in their thinking. Man-made gods are no gods at all, Paul says. Boy, if that's futile thinking... That is an example of futile thinking. The mind and the heart, their understanding, their ignorance. We're going to see in this passage the learning and the teaching and how the mind is affected by truth. All of these things work together. You know, I, I just constantly am aghast at the... the means the methodology, the thinking that is so prevalent in our current day and age. It's just another evidence of futile and corrupt thinking. It's an evidence of the darkened mind 
the lack of understanding that Paul addresses here. And because of all that, there is no life in these people. I think the most recent thing I heard just a day or two ago was somebody declared that pro-life people are more concerned about a, a glob of cells than they are about real people. You know, that is heartbreaking because that is their perspective. Darkened. Futile in their thinking separated from the love of God, from the life of God. Ah, oh, unreal. He knows their hearts and their thinking is futile. Psalm 94, 11, the Lord knows the thoughts of a man. He knows they are futile. Acts 14, Paul says, as certain ones were worshiping, were, were, re, were offering sacrifices to he and Silas, why are you doing this, he says, we're bringing you the good news telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God. They had no life. They didn't understand. Their thinking became futile. And hardness. Hardness. It's interesting. That's the last one in the list that we see here. Interesting that the way it's worded is it's because of the hardness of the heart that they are ignorant. Because of their ignorance, that's what causes them to be separated from the life of God, and that separation causes them to be darkened. Hardness. Interesting word here. Graphically, you know, if you've broken a bone, that you know that in the healing process you get a lot more calcification that's thicker and a lot of times stronger than the original bone where the, broke, the break took place. And that's one picture of this word that we see. That another is that it, uh, sometimes in a joint, the, uh, the calcification. So not only is there hardness, but there is a lack of mobility associated with this. People can't get themselves out of their situation. The unbeliever may always be learning, but never able, says 2 Timothy 3.7, to acknowledge the truth. In Romans chapter 1, what is the truth? Man started with the truth because God gave it to them. And in verse 21, it says, Although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking, there it is again, became futile. Same word. And their foolish hearts were darkened. There's another commentary. And when you don't acknowledge God and give Him glory that's rightfully His, and you're not thankful to what he's, for what He's provided, the result is darkness, futility, foolishness. So we read in that passage in Romans chapter 1, what did God do? And here, folks, we see the most dangerous judgment of God in all of Scripture. He gave them up. What? Yeah, he just let them go. You want to reject me? You want to deny me? You want to believe your empty lack of understanding, heart and mind? Okay. He let them go, verse 24. Interesting, if you were to take a religion class at any university in, in this country or probably around the world, you know what they would teach you? They would teach you the evolution of religion. They would teach you that man, in its evolvement of religion and spirituality, believed in free spirits. And they were very fearful of these spirits. They didn't know where they were or how they could interfere or, or wreak havoc on their lives. And we call that animism. But you see, over time, what happened? Why, men began to associate those free spirits with objects like the sun and the moon and, and animals and, and etc. And they began to worship those things. And we call that totemism. 
But eventually man evolved and began to, to associate and say, well, there were many gods, and we call that polytheism. And ultimately we come down to the faith of the nation of Hebrew, the Jewish faith, and then Christianity, and we finally evolved into monotheism, the worship of one God. Hmm, that's kind of interesting because Romans chapter 1 says it's just the opposite of that. Man began with a knowledge of the truth and turned from it completely. We don't have time to go through it step by step, but that's what is related to us there. It's the total opposite. God's history, God who was there at the beginning and we weren't, lays out what transpired. And all of this leads to separation. It's out of ignorance, hardness like that of a rock. Now, some people have thought, well, but I never knew. And therefore, I'm not culpable. My dear friend, God's revelation continues and says this in verse 19 of chapter 1, since what may be known about God, his divine nature, is plain to them. Why? Because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, from creation. There's no accident in any of this. And it's not here because of the billions and billions. You throw enough time at it, you can believe anything. It is here by divine order and design. Every aspect and you know what happens when we just have one little part of this body that goes awry. It is so finely tuned and so amazingly designed. Incredible. Well, then he, he gives them the idea that the next portion that we see here is that they are callous. They're, they're uh, let me see, verse 19. They've lost all sensitivity, and have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Boy, I would love to pick this apart more. Go back to Isaiah 5. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Yeah, totally reverse everything that God has said. My dear friends, we are living in those times. We are living in them. It's everywhere. There are no absolute truths to the unbeliever. We are given absolute truth by the Creator, the living God, who has said it before. They're depraved. What do they do? Depraved mind. They just go headlong into the horrors of the immorality, uh, the sensuality, indulging in every kind of impurity and a lust, a continual lust for more. Rampant immorality. Well, We've kind of come full circle from 17 to 19. In verse 19, this sensuality, every kind of impurity, it, this mindset and pursuit of all of this, we started out that they have a, a, a futile mind, futile thinking, and here it is now, we've come back around full circle, that that futile thinking and, and depraved mind leads into all these things. Well, how does the mind associate or connect with all these action types of things. Well, you may think, oh, well, I'm not doing all this stuff. I'm good. All of this is fulfilled. All of these action words come from the heart of man. You know, God says that it's what comes out of a man that defiles him from within the heart. It starts there, and then it leads to our actions. 
you know, in this day and age, we have many things working against us. You've heard a lot of folks say, wow, it's really rough to raise kids in this day and age, and I'm not going to have any because of that. I can, I can understand that, but you know, it's always feasible to raise godly offspring, no matter how wicked the generation is. Don't ever give up, folks. Don't ever give up. The perfect delivery system to the mind and our being in this day and age, eh, through the internet. We have every availability of don't have mine right in our hand. You know, statistically, I can't spend much time on this either, but our Christian churches are flooded with believers claiming Christ who are steeped in sexual sin through pornography. And in a group of this size, there's no reason to think that there are not some of us here that may be afflicted with that and be struggling with that. It's a reality. It comes from a depraved mind, and we've allowed ourselves to slip back in there. And Paul's warning us, don't do it. Don't live that way in the destruction. And he talks about a continual lust for more. What a picture. What a picture there. And why do you think pornography evolves into the horrors of child pornography? Why? Because people continue, they, they, they cease to be responsive and they're looking for something new to stimulate. And that's the direction they go. And here it is, this continual lust for more, more, more. And it is quicksand. It will suck you in and will destroy you. How could this be amongst believers? Interestingly, I'm thinking, Paul, why are you bringing all this up? Because it exists and the struggle is there amongst us as believers. 2 Corinthians 12, 21, he says, I'm afraid that God's going to humble me before you and I will be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery in which they once lived. What? Believers? Wow. God has called us to be different. So much about false prophets would lead us that way. If this wasn't a problem, Paul would never need to address it. So, marvelous thing to remember that as bad as our world is, God uses a lot of different things. The Spirit of God himself still restrains evil. The church, the fact that godly men and women and the body of Christ are still in a wicked world, we are a light, a beacon shining in the darkness. And God uses us as individuals, he calls us the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And he tells us to let our light shine before men so they may see your good deeds, your godly living, and what? Praise your Father in heaven. And the only way they can do that is that they come to Christ because of seeing your life and hearing the message. So Paul goes now from verses 20 to 24, the walk of the new self. There are four characteristics there. Knowing Christ. You, however, in contrast, did not come to know Christ in this way. You literally, you did not learn Christ. The root word there is the word we get for, dis for disciple, to become a disciple. It's a noun. It's a verb here. Excuse me. But you become a disciple. You're a learner. That's what the disciples are. If you're a disciple of Christ, you are a learner of him. You did not come to know Christ. You did not learn Christ in this way. Surely you heard of him. You heard him. It literally reads. They're not talking about face to face with Jesus because they weren't there with him. What did they hear? Well, they heard the gospel, the truth, the message. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. 
And that truth leads us as believers away from our dark, former darkened understanding, separation from the life of God, and our ignorance. We've been given understanding. We've been given life. We've been given knowledge as to who God is and what he's done for us. What's the purpose of salvation? It's to save us from this corrupt generation, says Paul in Acts 2.40. Excuse me, not Paul. Peter said that. Uh, we're given the mind of Christ. We're given the life of Christ, the attitude of Christ. And we are called to live in obedience to the Father, just like Jesus did. So we are knowing God's truth, verse 20. You didn't come to know Christ or learn him that way. We heard, and now in verse 21, we were taught. We were taught. Verse 21. You, excuse me, surely you were heard. You heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that's in Jesus. There's an ellipsis there. The verb isn't in the next verse, 22, but carrying on the ideas you were taught about the truth in Jesus and assumed and understood that you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self. Now, wait a minute. Didn't you just talk about that, Paul? Yeah. Why is he repeating it here? You were taught in regard to your former way of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted and is deceitful. Why? Were we taught about our old selves? Because we were being corrupted and that old way of life and thinking is deceitful. What's deceitful about sin? Wow. Could we go on here? You see, every time we choose to sin, and we're no longer slaves to sin because we've been set free to live for Christ, but every time we choose to sin, what are we doing? We are believing the lie. The lie that I will be happier, better off, more content, everything will be so much better if I disobey God rather than obey Him. That's the deceit. That's the lie. John 8, Jesus says Jesus, uh, that Satan is the father of the lie. What's the lie? Genesis 3. You'll be better off. There are no consequences for sinning. You'll be, you'll be happier. God's just trying to hide the goodies from you. That's the lie. And it pervades every area. That's why he reminds us again we were taught about the old self because it's deceitful. Don't believe it. And then we were taught to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. Wow, what does that mean? Again, as we were looking at the connection between the body and the spirit and the heart, the essence, we have been made new. Already looked at those verses. We are new creations. But then he says, but you have been taught to put on the new self. So we're to, we were taught to put away, to, put, to be renewed in our minds, in the spirit of our minds, the spirit of our minds, the whole essence of us, and to put on, to put on the new self. How are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to have to jump along here. Too many... All of these exhortations to put off the old self, to be renewed in the attitudes of our mind, and to put on the new self, they're elements of our salvation. They're not works that earn salvation for us. We can never remember, forget the gospel truth that it's been purchased for us through Christ. We need simply to receive his gift. Well... These are descriptions of our repentance, our turning away from the way we used to walk. We're taught to put it all away, to put on the new self. How do we do it? Well, a new heart, a new mind, a new worldview, a new understanding, a new offering of our bodies. What's our responsibility? Well, Paul says again in 12.1, I'm going to bring it back to your mind. What does he tell us to do? Because of what God has done, offer your bodies. You see, the whole picture, and I've got to stop here, that Paul relates our struggle, the civil war seemingly that's within us, not to the old nature that is still there fighting with us, 
That's been eradicated. But what is not yet eradicated is our unregenerate flesh. And Paul makes numerous references to the fact that the sin that we face, that we deal with, is because we are still in our unregenerate flesh. And I'm not saying uh, bringing forth the, uh, the dualism idea of the fact that, that spirit is good and flesh is evil. That's wrong theologically. Because Jesus Christ took on flesh. Flesh in and of itself is not sinful, but our unregenerate flesh we're stuck there. What are the passages that come to your mind? And we groan to be set free, to be given. We've crucified the flat. We've crucified our sinful nature. That's crucial. That's a fact, according to Galatians 5:24. But the flesh is still a problem. It acts like a magnet. You ever had a magnet and then a compass? And you get it anywhere near within the area and that it's, gonna, it's just going to keep pulling that compass needle off track. And the flesh so often wants to do that. Pull us aside. And we fight that. And the challenge is we need to turn from that. We need to surrender that. Paul in Romans 7 talks about the flesh and the battle there. We are new, but we're not completely new because we're still in the flesh. Romans 6, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. There it is, the flesh. I'm still in the mortal body. And if you're here today, so are you. Do not offer the parts of your body 6.13 in Romans, as instruments of wickedness. There it is. Same kind of thing he's telling us here. Turn away from that. But instead, offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. Wow, we have a choice. We're set free. We get to serve our new master because he has made us new. We've been set free from sin Later on in Romans 6, he repeats it. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness. There it is again, that lust for more. So now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. We have a choice. We have a choice. <laughs> Been made new in the, the spirit of our minds and we've we're to put on the new self. It says to be, that's been created to be like God. That's what he's made us like. That is an incredible truth in true righteousness and holiness. And the picture word that's used there is not the normal word for holiness, but it's a word that has a reference to no contamination. I'd like to close this morning. We're You've been, if you'd be very patient with me for another couple of minutes, with an illustration that I, I hope will serve um, to burn this into your hearts this morning. My daughter says, you have a blender, Dad? I do. Oh, I think this actually was too cold. I was trying to let it not be quite so cold. So, I have chocolate ice cream. Like I said, it's never really slowed me down. Yeah, we're going to put it all in there and make it good. Oh, yeah. And we add a little milk. Of course, you got to do that, don't you? Make sure that's going to work. Come on. Let go. Oh, well. Oh, well. <laughs> no 
think we need a little more milk. Oh, come on. Dad, you have a blender, you don't know how to use it. Yeah, it's pretty good. Just have one more ingredient. I'd like to know how much used motor oil is permissible to put in this and still be okay. How much? Oh, that all right? We got somebody to come up and drink that? Anybody? <laughs> Paul is challenging us in this passage, don't walk the way you used to. Don't contaminate your life. You become unpalatable. God longs for what? Clean vessels fit for the master's use. My dear friends, I implore you, allow God to work deeply in your heart and your soul to weed out anything that's not pleasing to him. He longs to use us for his glory. He longs to. And Paul is begging us, turn away from the things that destroyed. Yield yourselves fully to Christ. Let him continue to work in your heart and your life, wherever you are, wherever you go. Father, we ask that you would do that very thing, that we would give you the freedom to do that, what you long to do in our hearts. You bought us at a price we are no longer our own. Therefore, you tell us to honor you with our bodies. That's not regenerated yet. It will be. We long for that hope, that day when you will transform us our lowly bodies into your glorious body, just like yours. But that hadn't happened yet, Lord. We're struggling. Thank you for making us new inside and out by your incredible work through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.